So I thought we'd start the 2008 State of the City with the most talked about, uh, most needed, and probably least acted upon issue in America today, and that's the issue of health care. In San Francisco, I'm very proud that we're a city, not just of dreamers, but a city of doers, uh, a city of innovators and entrepreneurs, a city that tries to be on the leading and cutting edge, and in that context, tries to take responsibility and take account uh, to the world we live in. Now, the fact is, we have more people becoming uninsured in this country, not less. We have more people becoming uninsured in California, not less, and in San Francisco, that had been the case until very recently. Our city decided to become the first city in the United States of America to actually do something about the health insurance crisis and has now adopted what we commonly refer to here in our city as Healthy San Francisco. Now, let's talk about what this means. You got 45.7 million Americans without health insurance. We have seen premiums rise by 78% in the last seven years nationally. In California, just to put it in perspective, premiums have risen 95.8% as wages have remained flat. In San Francisco, premiums are about consistent with the state of California, but the reality is the gap, again, between those can afford health care and those that have it continues to grow and those that need it continues to grow until we initiated our program. 6.5, as many as 7.2 million Californians don't have health insurance, the largest pool of uninsured uh, in America. Second uh, is Texas. In San Francisco, we had, when we started our program, uh, roughly 125,000 of those uninsured until we realized that actually the number was a lot smaller. And I guess this is a point I want to make as I move into this slide in this presentation. The old adage, you need to know where you are in order to get where you want to go, I think comes to mind. We estimate the uninsured in California. As I said, 6.5 million to 7.2 is an estimate because I can give you three or four studies that give three or four different conclusions about the total number of uninsured. In San Francisco, when we initiated our Healthy San Francisco program, we estimated, again, that 125,000 figure. When, in fact, we did the analysis, we did the work, and we realized the number was actually much smaller than that. In fact, it turns out to be about 73,000 uninsured in the city and county of San Francisco. And by the way, there are five studies that show five different numbers, but the study of studies, the ultimate determination of the total number of uninsured in San Francisco, turns out to be 73,000. Interestingly, lower than we had projected. I don't know if that extrapolates out into California's projections or the U.S. projections. Some would argue it's the opposite, but in our city it turned out to be a little bit lower. And what that did is that framework of understanding allowed us to initiate a program. Now, we decided to do something differently in San Francisco. That is, rather than talk about how we could provide health insurance to the 73,000 uninsured, we asked a very profoundly different question. We asked how we could provide universal health care to the uninsured in San Francisco. That simple distinction, health insurance versus health care, allowed us to act differently, not just think differently about equating a solution to the challenge of the uninsured in our city. Health care is exactly what we're providing. As you can see from our current stats, and this is remarkable, 2008 has been a remarkable health care year in San Francisco. We are halfway there. Over 32,000 people are now enrolled in our Healthy San Francisco program. And the reason I say halfway, I reference the 73,000 uh, figure, is that we estimate about 60,000 are actually going to want to take advantage of this program. So those in the pool that actually are willing to take advantage, we are already halfway there. A universal health care plan that doesn't care about pre-existing conditions, a universal health care plan that is a plan that incorporates the private sector, not just the public sector. We now have literally 28 clinics and public and private partners as part of this consortium of support for a healthy San Francisco, meaning you can go to a city-supported health clinic or you can go to a private-supported health clinic. You can go to some of the largest hospitals in California, some of the largest in America that happen to have 
uh, locations here in San Francisco, St. Mary's, St. Francis, partnerships with the UC system, partners with Sutter Healthcare through their CPMC uh, locations in San Francisco. 14 private, 14 public. Complete choice within the system. A system of universality for health care that's second to none in this country. A model we believe to the nation. Not health insurance, but health care. And what that does is nothing differently than my health insurance. The downside of the health care versus health insurance is one thing. It's not portable. You can't take it with you. But as a resident of San Francisco, Again, regardless of pre-existing conditions, you can have HIV or AIDS, you can have a chronic disease, regardless of those pre-existing conditions, based upon your ability to pay, you are eligible for this program. So the question is, how do you pay for a program like this? We're well on our way to getting everyone enrolled, and you'll see here that we expect by this time next year, in fact, December of next year, almost a year from now, that we'll have complete completed this program, completely enrolled everyone that's seeking health care in our city. We pay for it, quite simply. It's a $200 million a year program. About $111 million comes from existing pool of money. The reality is we were already taking care of the uninsured in our city. I tell people this all the time. You can't afford not to do health insurance or health care. The fact is you're paying for it on the acute end. You're paying for it in those same community clinics. You're paying for it at the hospitals in the emergency rooms, paying exponentially more money. What we're doing is redirecting the money that we were already spending. $111 million of the $200 million program actually is that redirected money. What we're also doing is drawing down state and federal dollars because, and this is the big idea, it's not health insurance, people with HIV or AIDS that are eligible based upon income still can draw down federal dollars. They can still draw down a lot of state dollars, again, because they're still uninsured even though they're on our health care plan. So as a consequence, last year we projected in the 2008 calendar year, but through the fiscal year that goes into the middle of 2007, that of that $200 million program, 111 is redirected, $69 million comes from state and federal resources. In fact, we went out and got a grant of $73.1 million over a three-year period. It's the old idea, if money, you've got to find the money uh, to start a program. If money is the excuse, you're never going to start a new program. If you come up with a great idea, the money will follow. It's the same thing in the private sector, in the business world. You can put together a great business plan, you're going to find investors. It's the same idea here with our health care plan. We didn't know how we were going to pay for it. We just came up with a better plan than any of that we are aware of. And as a consequence, again, redirected money and new grants from the state and federal government, the money is now flowing. In addition, that gets us close to about $180 million of the $200 million cost. We have $12 million coming from the private sector. These are employers. About 85% of the employers in San Francisco are exempt. 15% actually make a contribution. It's about $12 million in the current uh, year. And then finally, uh, the remaining eight or so million comes from point of service fees, uh, which are co-pays uh, and monthly uh, premiums that people pay, again, based on their ability to pay. So, for example, you're earning zero to 100 percent of federal poverty. You pay nothing for the program, not a dollar of premium. One to 300 percent of federal poverty, you'll pay a nominal fee, 300 plus to 500 percent of federal poverty. You'll pay a little bit more. Again, scaled based on the ability to pay, co-pays, zero or very low focus on preventative care as opposed to acute care and I want to just stop and pause on that. A focus on preventative care as opposed to emergency care. That's the whole principle behind getting people health care is to stabilize them and to deal with chronic disease management to focus on health and that is a big part of now our focus in San Francisco is the health care delivery as we got people enrolled in our program now we're focusing on prevention and this is the irony. In this country, in fact, there are a number of studies on this, but they are conclusive in this respect, that the dominant, and I mean overwhelming majority of our health care dollars that we spend as taxpayers, goes not into prevention, but goes into treating people after they're sick. We believe it's cheaper to invest in people's health than to treat people's sicknesses. That's the principle of our plan but 96 cents of your dollars today in this country go to treating people being sick as opposed to treating and investing people's in people's health. Four cents of every dollar, that's it. 
into prevention. San Francisco wants to lead the way and move in a completely different direction. But first, again, we got to get people enrolled in this program, stabilize them in the program, then start redirecting that investment into the patients themselves, into focusing again on their health. So Healthy San Francisco uh, is one of the things that I'm most proud of as mayor. We had a lot of support, unanimous support from our elected family. Isn't that rare in America today? Uh, good folks from every ideological point of view all agreed that this is the number one priority for our city and we achieved it. And I want to thank Supervisor Tom Amiano for his leadership, for his counsel and his constancy on this, our friends in labor and the business community that came together in this historic way and the best director of the Department of Public Health in the nation, bar none, Mitch Katz. Had it not been for Dr. Mitch Katz, we would never have this program. And when I say it's a model for the nation, I just reference once again, you'll see that Connecticut and Philadelphia, the state of Connecticut, the uh, city of Philadelphia are looking to replicate this model and already Howard County in Maryland uh, has already adopted some of the core principles of this program. This is something we can scale. This is something we can advance. This is something we can bring to cities across the state of California, for that matter, cities and counties across America. Healthy San Francisco is one of the things, again, we're most proud of in 2008. And when you talk about a state of a city, you talk about the health of the city. And I could tell you, having witnessed the lives, the profound change in the lives of those 30,000 folks, that's a stat. But behind that stat are real people, not just the individuals themselves, but their family members that have sat there and they break down in tears because their lives have dramatically changed because mom or dad now have health care. And if something terrible goes uh, wrong in their lives, the family's not going to be bankrupt. This is life changing. And for me, as an elected official, life affirming in terms of what it's all about, the purpose of government. And this is, I think, a big part of it. So we're looking forward to framing this issue more broadly, looking forward to new president uh, and new focus and energy on this issue. 45.7 million Americans, that's a national disgrace. 7.7 .7 million more since George Bush became president. We could do more and do better. San Francisco's model is something to look at. As I think of San Francisco as well, in the context of leading the way, one of the principles behind our new strategy on health care is getting people uh, to go online to get enrolled. One of the things that is most significant about our health care plan is those 24 clinics that are part of this, again, 14 private, 14 public, they're all on an application process, an online web-based technology where you fill out one form and we actually communicate your specific health care stats and needs and qualifications, eligibility and the like uh, in real time to all of these clinics. So you don't have to go into one clinic, fill out forms, go into another clinic and fill out forms. Again, technology, a big part of the change, uh, technology, a big part of our efforts here locally. We recognize, though, that it's not good enough because it's not a medical record. And that's why in March of next year, uh, we're going to be moving forward with an RFP, a request for proposals. Basically, same way we started the health care uh, program, we're going to do an RFP setting the bar in this country uh, for electronic medical records so that they could be shared in real time. You can get your entire medical history when you go into that community clinic. You can get your entire medical history uh, when you go into an emergency room. Uh, God forbid you have an emergency. This is that order of magnitude change that needs to happen and take shape in this country uh, in terms of technology. We did the 1E e application process. Now we want to take it to the next level, become the first city in this country, not just with universal health care, not just with technology being a partner and a friend, not a hindrance, but now with a medical uh, uh, record. Again, we believe we can lead by example. Another area that I'm very proud that this city has adopted um, a strong investment and uh, approach of support is our public hospital. The anchor in this country, uh, or rather in this city, for the delivery of our health care services is San Francisco General Hospital. Uh, the voters just recently, uh, November 4th, overwhelmingly passed an $887.4 million bond, San Francisco General Hospital bond. What's remarkable about this bond is not only does it secure the fate and future of our emergency room, the only level one trauma facility in the state uh, uh, or in the entire region, uh, not only does it anchor our success as it relates to our ability to deliver, again, that quality health care and the universal uh, care that we're offering, 
but it does something, uh, I think, very significant in light of the economic climate that we're in. It actually creates jobs and creates opportunities uh, for thousands of people. We're going to start construction on this new uh, hospital uh, in just a few months. They're actually about this time next year, you'll see that construction in full swing. Uh, they're already going to start to grade the site. And the reason we're able to move forward with brand new hospital in real time in such a short order is because we invested $28.8 million in the pre-development work to make sure that this bond was an accurate bond, that when we're asking the voters for $887.4 million, that we're really not asking them for $1.1 billion, but that we're asking for something that we believe we can come in under budget and on time, and that we did all the environmental work, not just the pre-development work in the context of determining uh, the uh, exact design and some of the engineering specs, uh, but we did soil sampling, we did traffic flow studies, we actually did the work in advance so that, again, when this bond passed, as it did, we said we're going to start and we'll get those shovels out immediately. And I, again, I'm very proud of this. Uh, everyone came together. They allowed us to put in 28, again, $0.8 million in the last three years to make sure that when we asked the voters to get two-thirds support for an $800-plus million bond, that they did it with a faith and confidence that we actually know what we're doing. Um, and that's not always the case, as I'm going to reference here in a moment. But you can see, again, some other uh, schematics of uh, the rooms. This is a LEED certified uh, development as well, the highest level of green building uh, standards. Uh, it is, again, uh, a state-of-the-art facility that will anchor our fate and future as it relates to our investment in public health uh, for the next generation. Speaking of anchoring our fate and future to a next generation, you know, it's an amazing thing when we talk about 2008 and the healthcare delivery system in our city, that a year ago, we literally were lamenting that St. Luke's Hospital was going to go out of business. CPMC and Sutter had taken over St. Luke's Hospital out in the southeast part of San Francisco, uh, very close by to San Francisco General Hospital. The demographics of St. Luke's not completely dissimilar from the demographics of San Francisco General Hospital. If St. Luke's closed, San Francisco General Hospital, in spite of that bond, in spite of all of our investment and commitment, uh, would not be able to perform as it does today. We simply couldn't handle the capacity which means one of two things. You cut back on your service and people that least can afford us to cut back are most impacted. Or second, you create a system where people are moving throughout the region and creating a capacity problem, not just in our city, uh, not just in other hospitals around the city, uh, but throughout the Bay Area. We always believe that we're gonna do our part. Uh, and sometimes a little bit more than others. Uh, and that's why I'm so pleased that we had this Blue Ribbon Task Force that met for three months, led by Supervisor Michaela Alioto. And I just want to compliment uh, Michaela for her leadership on this. Again, Dr. Katz, front and center. Um, Dr. Brotman, uh, Ruffin from CPMC, uh, making the commitment to the community, making the commitment to the folks in the southeast sector, particularly uh, in the Mission Excelsior uh, District, uh, to maintain that fate and future uh, at St. Luke's Hospital. So what a difference a year makes. In the 2007 State of the City, we talked about lamenting about potentially losing St. Luke's. Now we're talking about celebrating uh, the commitment, ongoing commitment, and revitalization and rebirth of this remarkable facility uh, in our city. Good news. Now, here's more uh, in the way of good news, but I frame it in the context of the challenges, and that is dealing with an aging and grain population uh, that is larger per capita than the rest of the state. Uh, and let me just underscore what I mean by that. Uh, you can see here, this is our old census, and the new census numbers we think will make this arguably even more acute. You can see here, people 60 and over is that large bar, 65 and over is the blue bar, 85 and over is the green bar. In every single category, without exception, we have a population that is disproportionately older, 60 and older, 65 and older, as well as 85 and older than the rest of the state. Here's California, here's San Francisco, and here's just the counties uh, north and south and east of us. The fact is, more people living in this city, um, again, 60 
65 and 85 years older, which is an extraordinary thing from my perspective, but a humbling thing in the context of meeting the needs of a population that is getting older and living proudly longer. You can see here what I mean by that. We have also a disproportionate number of seniors living below the poverty line. So more people with more acute needs means the concentration, by the way, uh, in certain districts of the city. You can see where those, uh, that concentration is out, obviously, on the west side of town, not surprising to a lot of folks, but also perhaps surprising concentration of people in that Tenderloin area and District 6 area, which means we need to respond to the needs of our seniors by allowing them to live with dignity, to age in place from my perspective. And one of the most extraordinary programs is the one behind me up on screen, and that's our IHSS uh, program, our in-home support uh, service workers program. We're very proud to lead the state in terms of our commitment to the employees at IHSS in terms of the wages. Uh, no more noble work than taking care of seniors in every capacity uh, than the work that IHSS workers do. Uh, it's costly, but again, they're underpaid by objective standards, higher paid by California standards, but the work they do is invaluable. And the work they're doing is needed now more than ever. You can see from this chart that just a few years ago, in fact, this specific chart references the caseload has increased 74%, 74% just in the last six and a half years alone. And that's a 12% annual growth rate. Again, this bar, this line continuing to go up. We can imagine extrapolating it out over the next few years. But just since I've been mayor, just in the last five years, uh, we had about 15 or so thousand people on the caseload. Uh, now we're projecting about 21 or so thousand folks on the caseload. Again, a good thing because more people are getting in-home support services, more seniors are getting it. Uh, but again, a challenging thing because the budget of our city grows accordingly as the needs of our seniors and the acute needs, again, based on those poverty statistics, uh, grow along the same lines. Now, we talk about investment in seniors. We talk about aging in place and aging at home to the extent we can uh, and give people the support services they need. Well, that also needs to be reconciled in the context of providing adult daycare centers, providing transportation to adult daycare centers, providing support in the community. And another area where we're absolutely committed beyond just getting people enrolled in healthcare, beyond just getting people uh, in to uh, some of the best hospitals and acute care facilities in this country, be it SF General Hospital uh, or St. Luke's and maintaining the status of having a St. Luke's hospital. Uh, beyond that, we also want to invest in community-based programs. Now this is in light of the investment in Laguna Honda, which again is second to none. How many cities in America, let alone the state of California, still have a county hospital open and are investing in the long-term aging needs of their seniors in a skilled nursing facility like San Francisco uh, Laguna Honda Hospital? Here you see the schematics of this hospital when it is completely built out. And we think it'll be early part of 2010, our seniors will be actually moving into this facility. Originally designed for 1,200 beds and a $401 million budget. Reality is it's a $594 million budget, just 780 beds. By the way, there's a reason why. It's because everything I just said about San Francisco General Hospital, the $28.8 million in pre-development work, we did not do at Laguna Honda Hospital. This is not to critique the investment in Laguna Honda Hospital. I couldn't be more proud of it. Again, investing in the uh, long-term needs of our aging population in this city. But what we did is we estimated the costs and we were off by a huge factor. 401 million for 1,200 beds. Reality, 584 for 780 beds. Uh, I got a lot of grief when I came out against the original bond because I did not believe the numbers and because we did not do that pre-development work. I promised when I became mayor not to make the same mistake at San Francisco General Hospital. In fact, I don't know if many people recall, but four years ago, they asked me to put that San Francisco Hospital bond on the ballot in my first year in office, and I refused because we were going down this same path. And in fact, if you looked at what the number was four years ago, 
it was substantially smaller and I imagine where we would be today we would be making excuses about how we were so far off the estimates again for one reason we didn't do the work to justify the request and to dignify the taxpayers by making sure that we're investing their money wisely now we're trying to do our best to fix this and we found the five hundred and ninety four million dollars and we're proud of that and we're going to open up in two thousand ten but let us not make this mistake ever again we didn't do it at SF General Hospital as we do new bonds in this city let us mark the example of SF General Hospital let's mark not the critique but the observation of Laguna Honda Hospital but nonetheless let's celebrate as we are that investment into this extraordinary facility and having just recently toured it um, we are going to be the envy of the nation and uh, again these go to the values of our city you want to talk about San Francisco values public health investment again not just when you're very young uh, investment middle age uh, but investment uh, when you need us the most investment when you're 65 75 85 95 folks at Laguna Honda literally over a hundred years old I couldn't be more proud of that but again uh, lessons learned uh, and we're gonna get smarter in the future as I was referencing before that Laguna Honda slide I talked about aging and dignity aging in place outside your home in the community this is an investment we made. We started a couple years ago and we created a community living fund because not everyone believes that you need to be in a skilled nursing facility like Laguna Honda Hospital. Some people can't, again, as I said, be at home getting in-home supported services. So you've got that gap. Where do people go when they can't or shouldn't be in a SNF environment or at home? Well, we need to invest in creating that infrastructure to deal with the growing population. And so a couple years ago, we put a $3 million investment in the Community Living Fund. We added another $3 million last year. Remember, these were big budget deficit years. We still made those investments. And you can see already that we have already advanced the needs for some 457 clients since we started uh, that investment. We could do a lot more. We're going to need to do a lot more. I'm going to continue to fight for more resources to the best of my ability, recognizing the economic climate we're in, to continue to invest in this community living fund. But I'm proud we established the framework. I'm proud that we're at least marching down this direction. I'm proud that we're raising awareness and we're raising uh, the resources. Uh, to move forward. You can see just some of our targets and goals that we've actually exceeded um, uh, folks uh, in terms of percentages moving out of an institutionalized environment into the community living environment. Again, not everyone that's been in an institutionalized environment needed to be in an institutionalized environment. Some preferred not to be, but they didn't have that alternative. Now we're starting to develop that alternative, and that's what this slide represents, something again in 2008. Uh, I'm very proud of and uh, just proud of the entire, again, Board of Supervisors, the elected family, everybody in the spirit of cooperation, the spirit of commitment, uh, showing their resources and showing uh, that we can, again, lead the way as a city. Another way we're leading the way is our investment uh, in the discoveries for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and diabetes, uh, 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 brain tumors and leukemia uh, and other uh, diseases, HIV and AIDS. We are so proud we went out there a number of years ago and we competed against cities all up and down the state of California and we successfully got the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine, uh, CIRM, or the Stem Cell Institute to locate in San Francisco. Someone asked me the other day, said, well, that was great you got them in, but what's happened? I haven't been reading much. I don't really know what's been going on. Well, we thought we'd give a little update 2008 because this is the year that it's all happened. You can see from this slide that 26 California institutions have been awarded grants totaling $614 million. $614 million has been distributed. Remember, it's a $3 billion uh, uh, program and we've got these grants already uh, being distributed through UC, Stanford, other Bay Area institutions, UC, uh, getting uh, a good percentage of this money, uh, generating real jobs, generating uh, real opportunities. In fact, those opportunities uh, connect to the rest of the world. 
and this is important. We said this when we were going after uh, the Institute and why it was important to San Francisco's fate and future to get the Institute in this international city, this 24-hour global gateway city we call home, San Francisco. And that was we wanted to reinforce that connection, particularly again on these leading and cutting edge um, uh, industries like stem cell research. We wanted to connect it with the rest of the world. And by the way, we are literally the heart and soul of stem cell research in the world, meaning this is where the action is. This is where people are anchored because of this institute and because of the money it's distributing. Now that's gonna change, I'm convinced, with a new president. I think it will change very shortly after he takes over uh, in early 2009. But in the absence of leadership at the federal level, Californians stepped up with Prop 71 and we stepped in to get that institute anchored here in San Francisco. And you can see not only that $600 million has been distributed, not only those 26 institutions across the state of California benefiting. And by the way, those numbers by the time you watch this will probably be higher. But also these MOUs, these memorandums of understanding that are in place with countries like Canada and Australia, the UK. Again, these relationships we're forming with some of the best and the brightest and not just the throwaway line, best and the brightest, with truly some of the best researchers and minds and scientists in the world where we're establishing this relationship. We've got five more that are coming up. Again, California, the focal point. San Francisco, the hub of that focal point, that spoke, that, that anchor of that focal point. Something, again, we're very, very proud of, and we thought we'd celebrate that in the 2008 State of the City, and appropriately as it relates to uh, our healthcare uh, initiatives. Again, San Francisco leading the way. I thought I'd just conclude uh, this section of the State of the City by talking about a few other initiatives where we're demonstrating uh, that this is not just a slogan. Uh, one of those areas is in trying again to focus on health and prevention. And one of the areas we're really focused on is the health of our city employees. And we started an initiative called Shape Up San Francisco, where we're actually engaging our employees to get healthier. We have almost 28,000 employees, one of the largest employers in the state of California. Uh, and as a consequence, we need to lead by example. And we're doing a lot of physical activity. The California Endowment has been very helpful in this. It's become a model. Clinton Foundation uh, and others taking a look at this initiative. We've also engaged uh, in a walking challenge students throughout the San Francisco Unified school district and speaking of kids we've also done a lot of things in relationship to shape up san francisco to get our kids more engaged uh, by focusing on getting rid of sugar uh, sugary drinks soda free uh, uh, summer uh, initiative that we launched uh, the edible schoolyards which we are very strongly supportive there's 30 of them now in the school district i'll talk a lot more about that in the education section of the state of the city uh, but again trying to build on a legacy again of health health care, a focus on what we eat, focus on what we drink, a focus on the air we breathe, focus on the environment in the broadest sense of the term. Uh, and you couldn't imagine going to schools like I did uh, a number of months ago because I couldn't believe it until I saw it. We have these 25 salad bars in the schools. I never thought I'd see this in my life. I had this young, beautiful kid, couldn't have been more than eight, nine years old, and he's running up and he had a plate of broccoli, of all things broccoli. Uh, and he was very happy showing me uh, that he just got broccoli in the salad bar and he was actually eating it. I didn't have the guts to tell him not everyone loves broccoli, uh, but I couldn't be more proud. These salad bars are working. Uh, we got rid of all those vending machines years ago. We led the nation in doing that and all those, uh, those Pepsis and the calorically sweetened beverages and the like, Coke and all those others. I don't want to lay those two out, 7-Up, all the others. But now we're really starting to focus again um, on the alternatives to that uh, so people can start changing their lifestyles a little bit and those kids can educate their parents when they come home that there's better ways of eating. And one way we've done it substantively is these 15 wellness centers. Um, and I'll talk about that in the education section as well. Uh, we put in wellness centers, not just to deal with physical health needs, but adolescent mental health needs. Uh, in all our high schools, we're rolling them out. Uh, we've got five more going into the middle schools. And again, the wellness centers are about comprehensive health education in the broadest sense of the term, including what we eat, physical activity, uh, et cetera. Again, something I'm very proud of, Shape Up San Francisco, something that uh, I hope we can scale and we can see replicated across the state. Something else we did, Bogota, Colombia, of all places, Bogota many, many decades decided to close down a big portion of their city streets. 
Uh, other cities around the world have done similar things. In America, we really had it until recently, and I recognize it was particularly controversial. We closed about four and a half miles uh, from Bayview, Hunters Point, all the way down to the ferry building, uh, about five miles, just shy of five miles of street closures. We call them uh, Sunday streets. Uh, and the whole idea, and you can see from this slide, you can see people literally there on the Embarcadero. Uh, and here they are bike riding. Here they are walking on a street that has been historically dominated either by an overhead freeway. Mother Nature got that uh, removed after the Loma period of earthquake. Uh, or again, cars. Uh, and so the opportunity to democratize the streets, the opportunity to look at all these streets that represent a large percentage, I think 20, 25 percent of the landmass of our city, and to look at them differently, um, unveiled itself in this very successful two-day effort. Again, controversial, and I respect the controversy, but we pushed the bar uh, uh, forward or pushed the proverbial uh, initiative uh, to new heights. Uh, and raised that bar, and I think that it's something we should do more of next year. I hope in my 2009 uh, State of the City I talk about the program we did out there in the Great Highway, the program we did out in the Mission, the program we did in the Tenderloin, the program we did in other parts of the city, not just in the Embarcadero. Those are not literal example, examples, but figurative how I want to build this program and make it much bigger into the next year. I think this is something the city, again, can lead the way on, has been. Portland did a small version. New York's talking about it in Chicago. Uh, but I want to take it again in 2009 to a whole nother level, something, again, that made 2008, I think, a special year. Controversial, but special nonetheless. Another area where we're uh, trying to lead the way, in fact, not just trying, are leading the way, and this is controversial. But it's something that I think is important in light of, again, a new president in a new day as we've turned the page in this country. And that is something Barack Obama championed as one of his promises during his campaign. And that is to do a nationwide sick leave ordinance. Interestingly, one could argue modeled after San Francisco's sick leave ordinance. And I want to thank uh, those uh, of uh, folks uh, in the community that came to the Board of Supervisors and then went back to the voters with this initiative. And it was an initiative in late 2006, November, initiated uh, to help advance the needs of 115,000 San Franciscans that had no sick days. Uh, I don't know about you, but I don't think it's right in this country that when a child is sick, a mother can't take care of that child because that mother can't leave work because they don't have sick days. 22 million working women in this country don't have a sick day afforded them. Barack Obama is right to try to change that. In San Francisco, we led the way. We are a model for the nation. And Fiona Ma did an extraordinary job, and I want to compliment her, Assemblywoman Ma, by trying to advance this through the state of California. She came up short but she raised the bar in terms of her effort, and I compliment that effort. And I think it's an example, again, where our city can have a residence far outside its 47 and a half square miles. And I look forward to uh, President Obama actually doing what he promised to do in the campaign, recognizing the challenges uh, of the macroeconomic situations. Uh, but I'd like him to help us uh, example, uh, our uh, reference, uh, our example, again, uh, in a way that can have much broader scale for those 22 million uh, working uh, women that need it desperately. Interestingly, or importantly rather, uh, this initiative is the following. For every 30 hours you work, you accrue one day of sick leave, up to nine days. That's the model. And again, I think it's a framework that's a reasonable one. It may be a little more than they can bite off on the national level. Uh, it was certainly more on the state level. Uh, but I hope it's a direction, again, uh, our next president can take, maybe even our next governor. Uh, here in San Francisco as well, we're leading the way in something that doesn't get highlighted. And I thought, you know, why not take advantage of it in this state of the city? And that's hepatitis B. You know, we lead the nation per capita uh, in liver cancers. People don't know that about San Francisco. Lead the nation in liver cancers. It's disproportionately impacting the API community, the Asian Pacific Islander community. 
we need to do more screening. We need to do more in terms of prevention and vaccinations. San Francisco, working uh, with people like Ted Fang and others, have done a remarkable job. Again, uh, Assemblywoman Fiona Ma, who's been working hard on this, our health department, to really raise awareness. Again, if you're a member of the API community, I cannot impress upon you more the importance of finding out about free screening, finding out about ways of getting uh, uh, shots uh, that can prevent hepatitis B and liver cancers. It's something, again, that can be prevented. San Francisco wants to lead the way. Another area is tobacco. Uh, now, that's been legendary in our city. Uh, we were the first to fight uh, to ban tobacco smoking in bars and restaurants. I know some of those other cities like New York get a lot of attention for doing it years later, but San Francisco truly led the way. We also led the way in banning outdoor advertising of tobacco products around schools and playgrounds. I was very proud as a supervisor uh, here in San Francisco to author that legislation. Recently, I was very proud with Dr. Katz's uh, example, again, our director of the Department of Public Health and the Board of Supervisors concurrence and support, not unanimous, but almost unanimous support, to ban tobacco sales, cigarette sales, in pharmacies. Now, you'd think that that would have been self-evident to a lot of folks, but this was wildly controversial. We're the first city in America to do it. But what are pharmacies, if not health centers? Why do you go to a pharmacy? You get Nicorette gum, you get a patch to deal with your uh, uh, addiction, uh, your smoking addiction. Uh, you go to get uh, medications, you go to get the things that can actually make you healthier. Yet, at the same time, these same pharmacies were selling the same tool and weapon of destruction, which were the cigarettes that people were on one hand asking for a solution for, and on one hand actually contributing uh, to their illness. Nothing is more dangerous in this country than tobacco. With all due respect to the big tobacco companies, shame on you for suggesting otherwise. And I'm not talking about the stuff you pulled off in Congress years ago. I'm talking about what's happening around the world now. You travel and you see the predatory nature of this tobacco advertising and these tobacco companies and how they're building market shares around the world, particularly in impoverished countries. We're not going to continue to allow that to happen in San Francisco. And we've been very aggressive leading the way. And we're now doing it in pharmacies. And I know that they do not want to see this replicated in other cities and states, but we're going to push this because we believe in it. I think people will look back 10, 15 years from now and be bewildered by the fact that we were ever selling cigarettes in the first place in health centers. Interestingly, you know where this idea came from initially? The pharmacists themselves. They said they felt badly selling cigarettes and then selling pills for people's asthma and going, wait a second, I can't understand, or not just pills, uh, but asthma medication and other medication uh, to deal with other ailments that were exacerbated by their tobacco use. And they wanted to tell these people to stop, but they had the right to, uh, uh, to purchase those things. Uh, they just didn't feel good about it. They asked us to do it. Dr. Katz put together a team, put together the legislation with our city attorney's office. We submitted it to the board. They passed it. San Francisco led the way. Uh, again, something I'm very proud of. Another area, and I'll close this section uh, with just a few more slides we're leading the way, is on Medi-Cal lawsuit. You know, the state of California uh, cut $1.1 billion. This is the Democrats and Republicans. My friends in the Democratic Party, I know how difficult it is, but I couldn't believe it when I heard about it, that we were willing to submit a cut of roughly half a billion dollars from the city, uh, from the state of California, of which another half a billion dollars was matched from the federal government cumulative cut of a billion plus dollars for Medi-Cal here in a state that already pays or invests 30 percent less than the 10 top most populous states in America in Medicaid or rather Medi-Cal. We in California have 6.6 .6 million people that rely on it. These are the poorest of the poor folks and we cut it in this year's budget. That was wrong. We felt powerless, again, Democrats and Republicans making the cut, so we initiated a lawsuit with the CMA and others. Um, we didn't really initiate it as a county. They initiated it. We supported it as the first county to support it, uh, and we won. I couldn't be more proud of that, and you can see court ruling will now require the state to restore most of the cuts 
uh, into March of next year. 123,000 San Francisco residents relied on Medi-Cal. Had we not helped support that, had we not had the champion uh, up there at the CMA and others, uh, we would have had to deal with a $5.8 million cut locally. Uh, just terrible. Uh, again, what's government for if not to help those least among us? And Medi-Cal needs to be completely reformed. It's time to get serious about reforming it and not just championing cuts every year to get through a, the immediate fiscal crisis. It needs reform, I grant that. But one way you do not reform it is by further eroding a system that is so vital for, again, six plus million people in our state. Uh, final point in this section is federal advocacy. We've got a good president now. We have got the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. We've got senior senator uh, uh, from San Francisco, who happens to be uh, from the state of California. We're so uniquely positioned to advance our federal advocacy in terms of health care. And a lot of the areas we'll be focused on is trying to restore some of those HIV and AIDS cuts, those Ryan White care dollar cuts, uh, try to finally reconcile. This is the low-hanging fruit for President Obama to get that S-CHIP program reauthorized, the president that vetoed it. Now we have a president that will support it. That's the first thing clearly you can do. Zero to 18. Again, we're zero to 65, but let's at least create a level playing field. Zero to 18 in this country. And let's support, again, uh, some changes in Medicaid and Medi-Cal. And let's continue to work on prevention, uh, particularly obesity prevention, chronic disease prevention. Again, health care uh, and prevention focus at the U.S. Conference of Mayors, something that I've been working on uh, in my capacity as vice chair of the health committee at the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Again, I think uh, brighter days ahead of us. So again, state of the city and as relates to health, I think is very positive. We are investing $1.5 billion a year. I don't know many cities that do that, but that investment is paying great dividends. We're reforming our healthcare delivery system. It is a modern system. It's a more dynamic system. It's a system that's complemented with more information technology than it's been used in the past. It's a system that's focused on prevention, not just acute care, but a system that recognizes that acute care system still needs to be intact, as well as the long-term aging uh, infrastructure. Uh, again, Laguna Honda and our community community living funds, uh, I think we have a model for the nation. And as a guy who grew up here uh, that always recognized that, and now with the privilege of being its mayor, uh, I can't be more proud in terms of the state of the city in 2008 that health care uh, is improved or has improved dramatically uh, in this last year. And we are going to continue that uh, in the years to come.